Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be back again on the stage, and uh, again, very, very, very grateful to the organisers for uh, the kind invitation, and also for putting on such a, uh, an excellent uh, sightseeing tour for us. It cut it a little bit fine getting back, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. Enhanced recovery after surgery, and particularly focusing on enhanced recovery after HPB surgery. Now, there is some literature in liver surgery. I'm going to focus most of this presentation on enhanced recovery after pancreatic surgery. I'm using that as an example, but basically um, the enhanced recovery protocols are something that are applicable across a number of disciplines, and hopefully we'll cover some of the, the ground with respect to that. Traditional clinical trials often assessed a single independent factor so if we think about pancreatic surgery and a number of the randomized controlled trials, they might compare one anastomotic technique to another. Or they may compare stenting of the pancreatic duct with no stenting, or the use of abdominal drains, yes or, or no. That's the traditional way we assessed uh, outcomes in, in randomized clinical trials. Fast track studies or, or enhanced recovery protocols are a new approach and what they do is look at a, a more standardized structured multidisciplinary care pathway a package or a suite if you like of um, different modalities and it's really a multimodal approach to management of patients now Henrik Kellett who first proposed this the rationale behind it was that traditionally after surgery, the patient had a major intervention and had a significant impact on their functional status, on their physiological reserve, and that was known as the conventional recovery phase. But what he proposed was that by minimizing the pathophysiological disturbances, the functional impact was significantly reduced and there was a quicker return to normal function. And that occurred if there was a multimodal intervention which included aspects of pain relief, mobilization, the role of feeding, and reducing stress. Now, much has been published, much has been written. Probably the early literature was, was mainly in colorectal surgery, and various protocols were de developed with regard to lower GI surgery. And, and these were the principles. We could look at them in terms of preoperative factors, intraoperative factors, and postoperative factors. We don't need to go through each and every one, but just to highlight the importance of pre-admissioning counseling, explaining to the patients that, no, you won't be in hospital for weeks and weeks. We aim to get you out in, in a specified number of days. So for, for Whipple surgery, when I first started my practice, I told patients, she'll probably be in hospital for 14 days, two weeks, whereas now we tell them we, we would hope to get you home in six or seven days. And this is why. So setting expectations for the patient. Fluid and carbohydrate loading and avoiding prolonged fasting. Avoiding now bowel preparation and dehydration. Try to avoid pre-medication if possible. And these are some of the pre-operative factors. Anesthetic factors using short-acting anesthetic agents, perhaps an epidural, minimizing the length of incision, avoiding drains if possible, keeping the body warm, warm air, body heating, warm fluids, avoiding fluid overload. A lot of the, if you like, intraoperative or anesthetic variables that can be modified. And then postoperatively, minimizing or even avoiding the use of nasogastric tubes, thinking of stimulation of gut motility, using non-opiate oral analgesics and non-steroidals, getting catheters and urinary catheters out early, early perioperative nutrition, preventing nausea and vomiting, and very importantly, mobilization. So these package or suite of aspects, when you put them all together, is what enhanced recovery is all about. So how do we measure the impact of enhanced recovery? Well, what we want to show is that there's a speedy resolution of any pathophysiological disruption. Importantly, a speedy functional recovery. Patients get back to doing things 
And often the surrogate marker that we use to measure that is length of stay, the time they spend in hospital. But if we're going to try and push patients through a quick recovery and get them home quickly, it has to be without any increase in complications, no additional post-hospital care, and no increase in readmission rates. What we don't want is patients, yes, getting home quickly and having a short length of stay, but taking their drips and everything with them. This is not enhanced recovery. So what has been written about enhanced recovery in terms of pancreatic surgery? These were some of the early studies, and most, if not all of them, were in the United States. So these early studies throughout the 2000s, some fairly big studies, were essentially all in North America. But you can see that the length of stay was reduced in all um, situations, sometimes three days, sometimes six days being taken off uh, the length of stay. Really quite remarkable length of stay, getting patients home after a Whipple pancreatic duodenectomy in six or seven days. I'm going to pick a couple of these studies just to talk through them. This was one from MD Anderson. They looked at 148 patients, and they looked at the 18 months prior to introducing a pathway and 18 months after introducing a multimodal pathway. And what you can see in this is that there was no significance in perioperative death, there was no significant difference in complications, but a significant reduction in the length of stay. And this resulted in a significant cost saving because patients were in hospital for a less period of time. In this study, they showed significant um, financial incentives. This is another story, uh, study from Philadelphia. Again, 135 patients. They looked at 44 before historical controls, 91 after introducing a pathway. And this was their protocol. So on the day of operation, patients received preoperative heparin, they had uh, anti-DVT prophylactic stockings, TED stockings, prophylactic antibiotics. They did use an NG tube at the day of operation. They used two soft Jackson Pratt drains. Patients spent the first night in the intensive care unit. They received a patient-controlled analgesia device, PPIs and beta blockers. On the first post-operative day, they removed the NG tube, took it out day one, and allowed patients sips and to suck in ice chips. They got them out of bed, ambulating, again, continued DVT prophylaxis, PPI, and beta blockers, and moved them from the intensive care unit back to the surgical ward on the first post-operative day. On the second post-operative day, they allowed them clear liquids to drink. They removed the urinary catheter, minimized the amount of intravenous fluids, and started a diuresis. On the third post-operative day, they, the patients were on to a regular diet. This is after Whipple's. They were eating regular diet by day three. Day four, all medications were changed from intravenous to oral. They discontinued IV fluids and, and uh, aimed to remove one of the drains. The second drain was removed on day five, and they aimed for discharge on day six or, or seven. These were their results. Philadelphia study, again, they looked at complication rate and showed no significant difference in complications, no significant difference in perioperative mortality, but they showed, again, a significant reduction in post-operative days from 13 days down to 7 days with, again, a marked saving for the patient with no increase in readmission rate. So we had looked at this and thought, well, this is very good in North America. Basically, they do have a financial incentive to get patients home. They've got very good support in the community. A lot of patients, when they're discharged, go into a neighboring hotel facility and are looked after there. We wanted to know, could this be transferable to UK practice? Was there any way that we could get our Whipples home on day six or seven post-operatively? This is our historical data from the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. The unit opened in uh, 1989, and since then, uh, you can see the median length of stay after a Whipple's uh, was 13 or, or 14 days. It was between 13 
and 14 days. That was the median length of stay over a 20-year period. There'd been fluctuations, um, but essentially it hadn't really changed in, in 20 years. So we drew up a protocol, and this was the protocol. You'll not be able to read the detail of it, but the, the principles were that we sat down with our entire team, the surgeons, the anaesthetists, the nurse specialists, the ward sisters, the intensive care staff, uh, and we drew up a protocol of what our targets would be for each day, the day of surgery and day one to seven. And we looked at fluid balance, and nutrition, drains, urinary catheter, what blood tests should be done, what medications should be given, high analgesia should be given, and the targets for daily activity and mobilization. And for each day we had our targets. They were roughly based on that Philadelphia study, but not exactly the same. And we ran for 50 consecutive patients. These were 50 patients. Um, they were consecutive patients, and we wanted to see how well the compliance was against each of our targets. We had one death during this uh, period, and you can see a, a significant morbidity as associated with pancreatic oduodenectomy, 46% morbidity. But our median length of stay in all patients, we did get down to 10 days, significantly less than our baseline of 13 for those that had no morbidity or no complications, the median length of stay was eight days. And when we actually looked at our median length of stay for those patients that were deemed fit for discharge, but for other social reasons or, or, or logistic problems couldn't get home, our median length of stay was actually seven days. We had no increase in, in readmission rate, and uh, generally we felt we had made some, some progress. But this was interesting. When we looked at how successful we were in complying with the various targets, our aim was to get the nasogastric tube out on the first post-operative day. We achieved that in 78% of patients. Uh, resumption of oral fluids on the first post-operative day, we did fairly well there. We didn't do so well in removing the urinary catheter. Less than 50% of patients had their urinary catheter removed on post-operative day three. And we, we used epidurals, and because of that, they stayed in, their, in the high dependency unit until day two or three, but most of them were out of high dependency by day three. We had them onto a solid diet by day four and 86%, and you can see drain removal when criteria were met, mobilization targets, and we did manage to get a small cohort of our patients home on day six or seven, but the median length of stay uh, was 10 days. So what about other practice? That's UK practice, able to show it. Well, there's now various studies across Europe and indeed across the world showing that this can be done, it can be achieved. Um, the Milan group, 150, 15 patients with match controls, they were able to show significantly earlier mobilization, earlier feeding, earlier gut mortality, uh, and stopping intravenous fluids much earlier with no increase in morbidity or mortality and a slight reduction in the length of stay. Another group from Maastricht looked at it in a slightly different way and this was a very interesting study. They looked at the difference of an enhanced recovery protocol in patients that were regarded as young, those as under 65 years of age. The median age in this group was 57 and those that were over 70 years of age, the group had a median age of 77 in, in this. So they had two groups with a 20-year difference in their median age, but they looked at how applicable an enhanced recovery protocol was. And between these two groups, there was no significant difference in mortality, morbidity, or no, uh, in readmissions, and no difference in, in compliance rate. And their length of stay between a young age group and an old age group was 14 days. So rather than comparing with historical controls, they looked at age and did a, ran a study, not a randomized study, but a study between these two age group category patients and showed that the enhanced recovery protocol was applicable for patients of any age. 
In Asia, it's done in Asia. Traditionally, patients in Asia stay in hospital a lot longer. Um, there's a lot of reasons, perhaps, for that. But this was a study from Japan just published last year looking at 100 patients and comparing them with 90 historical controls. And basically, they showed um, a reduction in surgical site infection and in post-operative pancreatic fissure. It was interestingly reduced in the enhanced recovery day. Um, but what was most striking was their reduction in length of stay from 36 days down to 22 days. So what has been shown now throughout North America, throughout Europe, and now in Asia, that enhanced recovery after Whipple's pancreatic duodenectomy is feasible, is safe, and can be done. Uh, the enhanced recovery uh, group across Europe ha have um, drawn up some recommendations for perioperative care after pancreatic duodenectomy. And essentially, a working group was established to look at all the elements of this multimodal pathway and to try and draw some consensus about best practice. They focused down eventually uh, on, on 27 items, and this was published. It was simultaneously published in these two journals um, as um, a recommendation or a guideline. Again, these are the, the items that were looked at and the evidence base for each of these elements. We've already touched on some of them, but preoperative counseling, preoperative biliary drainage, whether you should or shouldn't do it, preoperative smoking and alcohol consumption, preoperative nutrition, perioperative immunonutrition, oral bowel preparation, preoperative fasting, carbohydrate loading, pre-meds, pre-anesthetic medication, antithrombolactic, uh, prophylaxis antimicrobial practice, and again, it goes on, epidural, the use of epidural or wound catheters, um, intravenous, the type of analgesia, how to avoid postoperative nausea and vomiting, the type of incision, avoiding hypothermia, glycemic control, the use of nasogastric intubation or not, and how quickly to get the nasogastric tube removed, uh, minimizing fluids, um, whether you use abdominal drains or not, whether you use somatostatin, you, when you get the catheter out, the role of um, bowel stimulation to prevent delayed gastric emptying, post-operative nutrition, mobilization and audit. It went through these 27 factors and made some recommendations. Basically, the essence of those was for units across the world to look at them and assess which ones they could apply in their setting and then put them together into a local protocol. And I think that's where enhanced recovery is really beneficial, when local teams sit down and decide what is feasible. A lot of the evidence base is controversial. It's not strong evidence. It's considered a good opinion and expert opinion. But the principles are, when these are all put together as a multimodal practice, that you can set targets and get patients home from hospital much quicker. So in summary, enhanced recovery after pancreatic duodenectomy is feasible. It can result in a reduced length of stay without any increase in post-operative complications, without any increase in readmission rates, and at some considerable cost savings. I think where we are at the minute is that we've shown that we have a surrogate marker uh, that this is good for the patients in that they're in hospital longer. But I think where this work is going is actually to assess the functional recovery of patients because ultimately that's what's important to them. How quickly can they get back to their normal activities of daily living? How quickly can they get back to doing the things that they enjoy? For some of them, how quickly they can get back to work or hobbies and activities like that. And so functional recovery is something there's very little data on, and I think that's what we have to focus on next. Again, I remind you of the uh, forthcoming um, European and, and African HPB Congress in Manchester later this year. Uh, it'd be lovely if anybody was free and able still to come. I know it's short notice, but uh, we're looking forward to an outstanding HPB meeting combined with the Association of Surgeons, Great Britain and Ireland, held in Manchester, UK, later this month. Chairman, thank you very much.